The title of this session is What are the leadership qualities we need to cultivate at all levels of business, society and politics? And on the platform with me are Faisal Shaheen, uh, who uh, leads the class think tank, trade union uh, think tank, Jonathan Bartley of the Green Party, Blair Palmer of this, that people thing, and Paul Green Jr. again uh, from the Morning Star Company. Uh, before I join them and start um, talking to them about leadership, I want to sh share something with you about um, how I develop my leadership skills. Let's have my slide. So this is me. <laughs> this is me in uh, Elder Scrolls Online. It's a, it's a, multi it's a massively multiplayer online. That's not me there. That's just some bystander. This is some ho horrified bystander. This is, uh, so this is me. I've taken a long time building him. Uh, I actually, I, I, I re-resurrected him uh, because I wanted to show him to you rather than, I, I, it can waste a lot of your time uh, playing computer games. But if you've, anybody ever played one uh, um, where you build a character and you, and you put your hands up? Oh, there's a few. A few women as well, not just uh, the usual suspects. <laughs> so, no, the interesting thing is, is once you get into it, it is very, very addictive because what you're doing is building um, irrevocable uh, skill sets among the... This person is very good at two-handed axe <laughs> murdering. Uh, and, and, um, and actually, you start from a typology, if you know anything about these games, the, the, the basic typology of character that you could start with is, what they, is either a tank, a damage causer, or a healer. It's really interesting that most of these, three, these games have characters that, revolve into these, these, uh, that devolve into these three categories. And um, tank is a person who runs at the enemy and hits them on the head with a double-edged uh, axe. Uh, damage causer is somebody who stands off and generally hits them with magical um, potions or uh, burning arrows. And healer is what it says, and you get points for doing all three. Now, the interesting thing is, and the only reason I wanted to bring this to you, is to look at this, uh, this little bar on the bottom. Most um, <coughs> multiplayer games have something like this. And um, what these are, are skills. Uh, the, this here is just... Uh, a kind of t top up, so you can have a kind of a, something on hand to draw, to sort of put your hand in your pocket in case you need it. Like usually, it's a, a potion to drink in order to make yourself not be paralysed by a dragon's breath or something. Okay, so you've got your your quick. It says Q. Your quick hit. Then you've got five skills uh, that you can use actively. There's lots of passive skills that you can also acquire, and then there's one ultimate skill, this thing here on the end. And that is, you know, use when in extreme danger. It is a very interesting uh, mental exercise to just to forget the axe, forget the armor, forget um, the face tattoo, which you can't see, uh, and think about um, what is, what would you, if you could design for yourself as a leader, would you be the tank? Would you be the damage causer or would you be the healer? And what would you be in your quick slot? What would be in your, your instant remedy that you would always carry with you? What five skills would you want? And what ultimate skill to be used in extremists? Press the button. You use it once an hour in the game, once, maybe once a year in real life. That's how I... I don't always think about it, but I sometimes think that if we, that we thought... Um, methodically about what we're trying to do and with a limit because what do people hate about this game all the aficionados who love these kind of games and know how to play them formulaically they hate the fact there's only five slots what I love about it is that there are only five slots and it forces you to choose what your specialist specialist skills are and um, you can't see it on there but you might be thinking, oh, well, you wander around and you bop people on the head, and it's all very interesting. The biggest activity, especially for young men who play this game, is running around in large groups. It's called zerging. You can zerg. So you run, and believe it, you run around in massive groups, and all the people do, all that they do, is help each other. And it's really interesting to, for what we think of as a kind of solitary pastime. All they do online is, in, in real time, just basically heal each other, cure each other, give each other 
um, thing. So it's not re I'm not even talking about the classic Anglo-Saxon white male form of leadership. There's just very interesting mental tool to take with you into the following discussion. What, what kind of leadership do we need? Now, I've kind of already... Um, see, I've retrieved my own phone from the water table, as we shall now call it. Um, what kind of leadership qualities do we need to cultivate at all levels of business and society and politics to go forward with the kinds of agenda that we are dealing with today? And... Um, I mean, we might stray into politics, I think, given that we haven't touched much on it today, but there's a sort of unspoken in, in the room uh, theme here of that we know what kind of leadership is, le is winning at the moment uh, with Trump, with Nigel Farage, with Marine Le Pen, etc. Uh, so we might park that and come to it, but let's just let me start with you, uh, Blair. Um, any responses to today, but above all, you know, any answers to the question that's above us? Well, I think it depends what kind of leadership you're trying to create. I think what we have created up to this point is leadership that is really actually about followership. So it's leadership that is, in, is meant to inspire people to follow. And we have some great tools available to those kind of leaders mm. today in terms of social media and sound bites and that kind of thing. Um, that makes followers become kind of stupid and bad <laughs> at making choices. But I think that there's another kind of leadership, which is the leadership that creates more leaders. And I think that's a very different style of leadership with very different skills, if you want to put it mm -hmm. that way. And I think we need more of that. Just explain to us what you do for a living and what, what your expertise is. Yes, that might be useful. Yeah, I kind of presume. <laughs> I just it. decided to get up on stage because I fancied well, it. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> it looks good up here. So I'm an author and a speaker on, on the subject of the future of leadership and the future of work. Um, I also coach, although I call myself an agent provocateur, for CEOs and, and senior teams, helping them rethink their leadership and, and what's actually going to, uh, to get what they're all looking for, which is engagement and empowerment and leadership from their people. Um, and I'm working on a new book, which is called Punks in Suits, which is about that very thing. Right. Now, Jonathan, um, I mean, I don't necessarily want the Green Party line, but I'm sure there is a Green <laughs> Party line on this. But just um, what is your response to this question? What, you know, we're at a nexus of business, society, and politics. And the, and the Green Party, you know all too well. I mean, I think your last uh, election manifesto was incredibly intelligent about understanding the re relationship of these three things. But what, how do you begin approaching an answer to that question? And I do agree with Blair. We have, a, we have a saying in the Green Party that we want to create 50,000 leaders. Mm. Uh, it isn't just rhetoric. It's genuinely the way we are set up. So all our policy is set uh, by the membership at our conference. So the leaders are essentially spokespeople. We don't have a direct say in the policy. We're there to represent the policy of the party. I think what we're seeing in the country at the moment is a real disconnect. We have an economic <coughs> crisis. We have a social crisis. But it all stems from a leadership crisis. You know, we have a prime minister. Uh, I don't want to get too political too soon. But a prime minister you know, got the job because everyone else ran away, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, effectively. You know, no one else wanted it in, in the post-referendum context. We have. Jeremy Corbyn, who you know, many of us admire but feel as if he can't create those leaders within the party. You, know, you can't create that party of leaders to move with him. He's got a very divided party and he can't create that consensus. And so we are in a leadership crisis. And I don't know how many people have seen um, Kathy come home again. Now mm -hmm. it's the anniversary. But I was watching it the other night. And just at the end, they flashed up on the screen. This is 1966, 21 years after the end of the Second World War. Um, West Germany has created twice the number of homes that we've created in the 21 years. And it suddenly struck me, yeah, it's about political will. Mm. At the end of the Second World War, we had uh, a national debt of 250% of gross domestic product. You know, huge compared to what we have now. But we set up the NHS. We set up the modern welfare state. And we did it because people came together. And they shared a common vision. And that vision was inspiring. I just look at the country now, and I think... We can be so much better than this. We can be so much better than this, and it, but it needs that leadership. And in the referendum, we've heard a howl of rage from people who uh, have been promised power, mm -hmm. 
Uh, under the Blair government, they were promised you know, to be stakeholders, and there was a talk of community. Then we had Cameron's talk of the big society, but they were never given an end. It isn't just about leadership within political parties and allowing people to come forward and be leaders, but it's about having leaders in the communities, people having a stake in the communities, a radical decentralization of power that we actually take seriously. And it's a scary thing to do. It's a brave thing to do, but I think that has to be the future. If we're going to heal the country, I'm a healer. No. Right. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Good. Well, no, no. I am definitely a healer. Uh, Pfizer. Before before we go on, like, just tell us a bit more about class. You know, it's, it's a, it's a tra think tank set up by the trade unions. Uh, you yourself have you know uh, similar background to me, economics, a bit of TV. We remember we were on TV together. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, okay, the unions. You know, I mean, you, you could argue, but even by setting up a think tank to do the thinking at one stage removed. That's a, a fairly hefty decentralization for the people who, who effectively pay your wages. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a good question about why, you know, why they did that and what, where, that, where that comes from. I mean, I think for me, so I sort of started having to manage teams, obviously in this role I'm the director, and, but in my previous role as well, and kind of being quite new to leadership, I'd never really thought about what that means. Um, I knew when someone wasn't a good or bad leader, but I hadn't really looked into much depth about that. Um, and maybe by the union saying we need this space for all of us, and we know that sometimes they have their own friction, mm. was a sign of some kind of leadership showing that, that we, we need to come together on some of the ideas at least. Um, I, I've had this whole thing now of being the director and having staff and, and having to be a kind of leader in, in a sense and having to take that up. And I just it really strikes me hearing, you know, hearing this about, we just don't know what that is for me, especially when it's, I, I bought some books and um, everything just seems very kind of male and Anglo-Saxon and something that I couldn't fit into in every, in every way of being a leader. Um, and so it's a bit like, for me at least, it's a bit of making it up as we go along. But the most important thing, and it coming back to the politics, is the values. Um, I see so many politicians and other leaders that don't embody the values that we want to see in society. So it's not just how you do things and how you inspire mm. people. It's, not, it's that actually having those values in the first place. Mm. Uh, that just reminds me that, um, that for those of us who covered American politics for some time, that what, what a lot of people think just happened is that the Tea Party uh, itself sort of basically, it, it's finally it, the, the kind of you know, kind of ballistic missile that fired into politics in 2011, 20, 2008 actually, after the, uh, after the bailout of the banks, which they were against, finally landed. But in actual fact, the, the, um, the thing that we used to, you know, quietly sort of take the rise out of was this annual conference in America called the Values Voters Convention. And it was, and the Values Voter is at even more low level, lo local level, base level, conservative, what they mean by that is anti-abortion, you know, anti-immigration and the rest of it. The values voter was something that you had to turn up to and speak to, even if you were just giving them the soft soap. So values clearly have played a part in what has happened. And I, I hope to come back overtly to these political questions, but to just keep us on the, on the general the themes of leadership, um, you know, wh wh what would your response be to that? And what, what is good leadership? Yeah. Um, I mean, I honestly think um, it's living, those, for me, those progressive values. And I was thinking on the way here, and you know, I struggle with thinking about leaders that I, I look to. There's people that I admire and things that they say that I really like. Um, but weirdly, it's uh, things like <laughs> my local um, place where I go in, in, it's like a beauty shop. Um, and uh, this woman that owns it, she's a Pakistani woman, she's first generation. She's like expanded the business. Her team is always really happy, but she also does this thing about hiring a real mix of people. And she's like an accidental leader mm. of the community. You know, it just makes me so happy. There's a Iranian person there. There's this Pakistani lady there. They swap the music halfway through from Romanian songs to um, Hindi songs. And I, I, for me, it's really about, um, for me, the leaders have to be Embodying, embodying those values and making sure that it happens. So that, to me, like, she, to me, is a leader, even though she probably doesn't even think about herself that way. That's interesting. I mean, uh, before I bring you and Paul Green, Jr., uh, 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 one anecdote that when the whole Jeremy Corbyn sitting down on the train thing happened, sitting down on the floor of the train, and there were some big criticisms, you know, well, it, it, as it worked out, it was, a, it was the story was kind of 
a, a, a kind of privatised stunt job by somebody who doesn't even work for him. But uh, we were talking to a, I was talking to a, a friend who was a trade unionist, a very, very bolshy trade unionist woman uh, who's led strikes. And she said, I couldn't believe you were sitting there and on the floor for that reason. And I said, why? She said, be she said because I have led a revolt on a train to go into first class. And, yet, and she said, because a real leader would have got up off that floor and taken the entire train into first class and refused to move. <laughs> so you see what Jeremy is up against when, he's, when, he, when people accuse him of being a facilitator. Um, but, Paul Green, what, what does it mean to be a leader, then, in your company and the comp you know, in, in, in a company that has self-management as an inbuilt principle? That's a good question. Um, <clears throat> That's a very good question. <laughs> All the way. All the way. Oh, you want to? You want to answer? Uh, somebody. To, uh, I read somewhere that I'm not a politician. I've never been a politician. I read somebody somewhere that the best politicians actually don't ever answer the questions they're asked. They ask other questions and then go on to say whatever it is they I'm feel like saying. That. I'm good with that. Uh, <laughs> um, so I mean, so I think there are two things at, at a general level. Leadership qualities that I think are maybe outdated in, in leading into a direct answer to your question. I think there's this misconception and, and certainly not timely perspective that uh, leaders are saviors. And, and in order to kind of perpetuate that, it seems to be, be the case that leaders, certainly at the national level, but I think also at the local and business level, leaders kind of try to figure out how to manufacture a crisis not saying that there aren't plenty of crises, but try to manufacture a crisis that they can easily pin on someone else, mm. and then conveniently have the answer for, you know, here's how, here's how I'm going to save mm. the world. I don't think that's actually all that useful. Um, in fact, I'm certain it's not that useful. Uh, not that we shouldn't be working on problems and crises. I think there's plenty of important stuff that needs to be done. Uh, but that's just, that's just about kind of, I guess, finding an office or, or occupying a seat or, or uh, which, which I, you know, from my perspective, the place I come from, is it, there's, there is no seat like that. There is no opportunity to occupy a, kind of be the sole occupant of the leader seat. Mm -hmm. And I think the idea that there is a sole leader seat that somebody has to occupy kind of has this way of giving rise to this tendency to manufacture a crisis so I can prove why I'm the best savior. Um, and, and, and so I, I th in Morningstar, I, I think leadership comes down to um, the ability to convince other people that here's something that's worth doing. And it turns out there are lots of really important things to work on, and lots of people have their own pet causes. Some of them are really big and important you know, to, to lots of people, and some of them are really small and may seem inconsequential to a lot of people. But it turns out most people have their own kind of pet thing that they're really interested in. And I think at Morningstar, what it comes down to is can you, over time, cultivate the trust, enough trust in people that they're willing to give you their time and their energy willingly? Because this, I mean, this, this critical point, an organization like ours, people have to grip, give you their time and energy and, at some level, devotion willingly. And they have the right to revoke that anytime they want. So I think, I think you know, leadership number one, I think, from Morningstar's perspective is, what is the degree to which other people are willing to give you themselves <coughs> willingly and perpetually give themselves to you willingly knowing, no, with you knowing that they can revoke that at any time? And number two, recognizing that there's so much important stuff that needs to be done, there's, it really makes no sense for us to have a seat that is the leader's seat and us to all compete on sitting in that seat rather than working on the important things that need to be worked on. So, mm. Okay. Blair. Without revealing the secrets of the, uh, of the, of the consultancy uh, sort of horizontal leather couch that, that you may or may not have the CEOs blubbering on. Um, what, they do blubber. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, are there, any, ge are there any generic <laughs> themes in, in the current business climate that, are, that, that jump out at you as a practitioner across several businesses mm -hmm. that, are, that people should be aware of in, when it comes to leadership? There's clearly a fashion for soft skills, etc. Mm. But what, 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 what is... You must get together with people who do your job as well. So what is the landscape looking like for pro the problems of leadership? Yeah. 
so I, I should say that I've always um, hated the term soft skills. Mm. I don't know what it means, actually. I don't think anyone does. Um, and um, everyone always inserts the word fluffy mm. in between soft and skills anyway, which makes it even worse. Um, so, so, uh, so I don't like that term. I think what they really mean is people skills. Mm. Um, but I, I'm also not thrilled about that, actually, as a concept. I think, I think what we're really looking for is human skills. Mm. It's people who are able to be human at work, and that's really attractive to us at the moment because we don't see very much of it. Um, so it's really very refreshing when you meet a, a leader who's human. Um, if, if I think about, you know, the leaders that are lying on the couch having a good cry, um, I, I think that they are hugely frustrated. They're frustrated that they did an MBA and they read all the leadership books and they've worked their way up and they've done the leadership programs and they've, they've learned to coach and they've learned, you know, some special listening, magical listening skills, and they, they've done all that and it is not working. Their people hate them. Their people don't trust them. I think the, the latest statistic from earlier on this year, the Edelman Trust Barometer, 18% of people trust their manager to tell the truth, 18%. Mm. So the vast majority don't trust them. And, and they're good people. You know, it's easy to see them as evil. Um, they're actually good people with lives that they would like to live and families that they would like to see. And they've dedicated their lives to trying to create a business that, that provides employment and makes great stuff for, for, mm. this, for the world. Um, and it's just all gone horribly wrong. People, people aren't listening to them um, and the products are, are damaging the world. And they, they, they are kind of powerless. Um, and I think it's at that point that they normally call me when they've tried everything else. Um, and I'm sure there are people in, in this room now who've had that experience. So I think that there is a, a growing kind of bad taste about what they've been told about leadership. Mm. And they're wondering, they're desperately wondering if there's something else. I mean, we've known for nearly two decades now that the, you know, the, the social responsibility meme in business was stronger, I, the, the demand for it was stronger than the supply. I, I can remember people in the consultancy business saying to me, we this is nearly 20 years ago, we cannot recruit because people don't want to tell their children I destroyed the world. Mm. You know, we, they, we can't recruit to oil <laughs> businesses, we cannot recruit to FMCG businesses, all the rest of it. So we've known that for a long time. So, so is there a sense in which people thought they could solve these things through management skill techniques? without taking on board what the social mission of the business was. Because what you're describing is a mismatch between desire to you know, please everybody and be popular, and, and, and you know, in the end of the day, you make widget X that destroys the planet. Yeah, and I think it goes back to something you said right at the start of the day about uh, the, what you call the sort of post-capitalism, I think of as the end of the industrial age. Mm. Francis talked about it as well. You know, the, there was, I think at the beginning of the industrial age, there were industrialists who wanted to create businesses as a force for good. Mm. They, they were really inspirational. And I think over the last 200, 300 years, we really lost our way in that. And that business has become something else. Um, business has become about profit primarily and about pleasing the city analysts. Mm -hmm. so, so we've really lost our way. And I think that that's the sort of fundamentals. They find themselves stuck in a system. Mm -hmm. And no matter how well-meaning, they can't change the system unless they're really willing to look deep into the roots of their business. You can talk about purpose. Most of these companies, they may have a mission on their homepage, but that is not what drives decisions mm. in the organization. Profit drives decisions mm. in the organization. Jonathan, what, what, what have you seen in terms of um, <coughs> both individual practice and, and politically? I mean, what, what, what drives you know, the manifesto that you, your party went to the 2015 election on? You know, it was very detailed about some of this stuff. What drives that? Passion, you know, one of the things they used to kind of joke about the Green Party is you don't join the Green Party for political ambition. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I've met so many people who are absolutely passionate about changing the world, and I know that's why I'm, I'm in it. I, now, I have to come clean. I'm a bit of a leadership virgin. Um, you know, I've only been in the job two and a half months. Um, but I went to Caroline Lucas, who's my co-leader, the MP uh, around here, um, and said, look, how about a, a job share? You know, mm. we need to model a, a new form of leadership. And... 
it's a very creative environment because of that passion, because of that conviction, because of those values. You know, instantly it's, well, yeah, why wouldn't we do that? We want, let, let's push back the boundaries, let's change things. And we became the first uh, job share leaders of a, of a political party, and that's, that's really exciting. But I did work in the, in the House of Commons in the early 1990s. Um, d dirty secret, I even worked for John Major briefly <laughs> in 95 on his leadership election against John Redwood. I'm not a Tory, honestly. Um, uh, and um, I found Westminster such a dark place. I found, you know, having come out of the London School of Economics, where you're taught to weigh up decisions, uh, weigh up issues, see the, the pros and cons and make a sensible decision, I suddenly found myself in a political environment where there's no two sides. You know, this is your side and you make the case and you undermine the case of your opponents. And that makes for very bad decision making. But that's how leaders evolve in the political process. You know, the whip's office, as you will know, is just stuffed full of political ammunition. And it's fed to the back benches, and they go in and they rally behind uh, their leader and they make their case. And that's just a bad way of making decisions. It's a bad way of doing politics. Um, and in the Green Party, you get sometimes frustratingly <laughs> uh, big debates about policy issues. And we really get to grips with the policy. But at the end of the day, it comes out, I think, better comes out sharper because people are making judgments, yes, passionate judgments, but there is that room to debate and discuss and have opposing views. You know, we don't have a whip. As, you know, if we had more than one MP, mm. that would be important. Mm. <laughs> I mean, yeah. That, you know, the principle is there. We don't have a whip. I, I mean, it, it's interesting, isn't it, that you mentioned the dark side of Westminster. And, and it is, I, I think it's, it's fair to say people don't realise how much of the... Everybody understands uh, cabinet responsibility is collective responsibility and that there is usually a very strong ideological apparatus around the, a party leader like a prime minister or a leader of the opposition to create their you know sort of to, to fit the jigsaw pieces together so if you're going to do if you're going to spend x billion uh, on stimulating the economy you need your you need your industry person and your green person and your employment and they need to all be singing the same um, hymn sheet but people don't realize that, that the the backbench situation of all the major parties is held together through this incredible carrot and stick um, mechanism the carrot is promotion and the carrot is you know not simply that we've seen honors we we see honors in this country given again and again by all sides as the ultimate carrot um and then stick is literally, as you say, it is a series of scandals that have been suppressed. And the uh, tabloid newspapers create those scandals, and then they go and they say, we'll suppress it. Uh, will it. What will you do if we suppress this? This is going on. Now, my question is to you, I can kind of imagine the answer, but what is the solution? Because businesses know this is going on. And then the moment we're all pushing for businesses to be more human, to be more... Uh, horizontal to be less hierarchical they observe the ultimate form of, of, of coercive hierarchy is politics so what, what can we do about that, that transmission of that lesson uh, some of the change has to be syst uh, systemic um, and I think it is just a matter of time before our voting system our first past the post voting system fragments and breaks up it, it's creaking it's crumbling it's not fit for purpose but this could be 30 40 50 years but it's essentially what holds everything together and you know everyone in this room will probably be changing their votes between elections now no one votes you no know, labor 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 every year conservative every year people want choice they they're, they're more plural and we're seeing the disintegration of the two party system in 1950s uh, 95 people 95 percent of people voted for the two big parties now it's about two thirds and it's declining you know clearly in the long term trend and until we get change in systemic change, change in the electoral system, there won't be that freedom. And once you do have that freedom, you can do things in a different way. You know, the House of Commons is set up tribally with two parties who are actually two and a half swords lengths apart from each mm. other. That's how it's measured, with two lines. You're not allowed to step over the line. It's all historical. And it's on the basis that you have a government and then you have an effective opposition that kind of holds that government to account. It's a very old style of doing things. Now, if you break that system up and you have a proportional system where people are actually talking to one another, dialoguing to one another. I don't think compromise is, is always a dirty word. I think mm -hmm. compromise can be really good politics. You find the way that represents the majority view. You find the way forward. And that gives people the freedom. Mm -hmm. And in other countries, you see this freedom. You don't have the need 
uh, for the whipping system. On the London Assembly, you have a different system where uh, Labour and Lib Dems and Greens, London Assembly members, work together. In the European Parliament, you have MPs working together, MEPs working together. And there, it's a very constructive form of politics. So if we can bring about that systemic change, mm. uh, both in politics and, of course, in businesses too, I think you'll see uh, the behaviour follow. I mean, Pfizer, you were nodding at some of that, and I wanted to get your views on that, spe on the specific political bit. But coming back to the kind of general applicability of um, what kind of business skills do we need? I mean, w we are, and I'm going to come back to soft skills. Let's call them human skills. Let's not call them collaborative skills, emotional intelligence. Aren't we at, at the same time learning that people who just stamp their foot and go for post-factual politics or in business go for absolute, you know, um, without wanting to be libelous, you know, um, you know, absolute flouting of all norms, they, they win. Um, so what do we do? Yeah, but I think we've also learned that us on the left are with progressive values, um, doing the same thing doesn't help to beat them. Mm. So I do think that there's something that needs to change in terms of how we behave, and it's definitely systemic, and, it's, and that's why it's such a big problem in a way, because the challenge isn't just something that we can change tomorrow, some, some small tweak. It's fundamental. And one of the things that I want to add to that, when I, you know, over the last 10 years or so, I've had to meet with MPs, work with MPs with, from um, both uh, mainly Labour, and, but also the Conservative Party in, in a previous job. And so often they're not people, they're people that have been raised from day one to think about their ego, to, to be competitive, to be want to be at the top, to want to have that seat of leadership. Um, and not always aware of what it's like for, for everyone else that isn't raised in that way. Um, and that's their idea of success, and they have a very narrow idea of success. And there's so many of them in Parliament that it's almost like asking them to actively think differently. I mean, it's just a, it's a real challenge for them because they've just never had it that way. This is their idea of what governance should look like or what leadership should look like. Um, so it, it, it's a real value change, but we're, we're not going to win against the likes of Farage and Trump if we just do the if we emulate the same values as them and the same ways in which they work. Um, so it's absolutely the time to think about how, how we show that cultural change. Paul, the same the same basic question. I mean, it, you must have competitors. I mean, you're a big the, the Morning Star company is big big market share. You must have competitors that don't do all this stuff. Totally. And do, do, what, how does that figure? How does, that, how do the, how does the market signal uh, come back to you as to whether what you're doing is right or what they're doing is right? Well, um, so it's, it's not, I mean, it's not completely clear to me that any of our customers care about us for any reason other than we give them great product at mm. a good price. Mm. Uh, it's possible. Mm. Um, we, I, one thing I will say is we don't really depend on that. We don't really depend on, um, you know, customers giving us credit. If that's the a question you're asking, yeah. we don't really depend on customers giving us credit for no. being special or, or different or better. And in fact, I, got, I have to be honest with you, um, I, don't, I don't think at any point we've ever really thought about what we do and, how, and the reason we do the, the things the way we do them as like normatively or morally sort of driven, like mm. this is the right thing to do and, uh, you know, the other way is the wrong way to do it. Uh, for us, it always seemed more consistent with human nature. Yeah. And I think it's only, in, it's only on reflection that, we, that it seems like this does seem like a better, like from a morally or, or you know, ethically, ethical standpoint. So, uh, so I, guess, I guess first part of your question is it's not clear to me that we get extra credit for being good people, mm. for being a good organization. Um, we're not motivated by getting extra credit. I do think that it serves us well for whatever it's worth. I don't know how this translates to politics, which quite honestly is probably a lot more interesting than tomatoes. Mm -hmm. um, you like that, I said it right. Uh, but, so it's not clear to me how this translates to politics, but, but I don't know if, if uh, the way we do things is a competitive advantage. My instinct is it is, but I don't have a counterfactual other than our competitors, who also seem to do fine maybe not quite as good as us. The one thing I will say is that um, our way of doing things seems to have, we have flourished at, and, and we have kind of risen to the top in spite of our way of doing things. So either it's a contributor or it's not detracting from our way of doing things. 
and, and I'm realizing I'm not a doing it all answering your question. No, you are, I think. I, I, I'm, I'm, you're making me think about, about the following. One interesting thing is the person who started your company was yeah. a small scale entrepreneur. I think totally. was a truck driver. Truck driver, or, yeah. Yep. Uh, and also, many mm. of the people who work there will, will be close to the land. Yeah. So, you're thinking about uh, California, uh, migration from Latin American countries, yeah, people with, a, with land background. When yeah. I was there, the orange groves were full of Mexican that's, and that's right. Hispanic uh, migrants. Is there a closeness to the land thing about this um, form of leadership? I mean, you know, the fact that it can kind of work. If you'd, have, if you'd have started in Pittsburgh, where everybody, Pittsburgh was founded as, a, you know, as an industrial city, you maybe wouldn't have found so many people who wanted the frontier freedom kind of self-starting mentality. Yeah, I mean, I think there, there, there's probably some truth to that. Uh, it, it intuitively makes sense that, you know, people who are close to land, or California has this sort of cowboy heritage a little bit. Um, and, you know, uh, we, I think people from, from you know, Morningstar, like, they don't trust you if you walk in dressed like this. Uh, what do you dress like then? <laughs> Jeans and a pair okay. of sneakers, so. Okay. Uh, what do you call them? They're not sneakers here, are they? Trainers. Trainers, yeah. Sports shoes. Sports shoes. Um, <laughs> so, so <laughs> I'm learning. I thought we spoke the same language, and yeah. I'm learning. I, I, I'm terribly ineffective at Communicate, but I, I will say I, I think I, th I think there's some truth to what you're saying, but I think there's also some truth to the fact that I think that our way of doing things has an influence on the way people think, as well. So I, I mean, I, I it's it's remarkable to me the proportion of folks in our organization that go on to do entrepreneurial sort of things, hmm. and it seems high, much higher relative to other companies like ours with people with the background and training that our folks have. So I, I think that our way of doing things naturally seems to lead to people to, to be, so number one, more comfortable in who they are and be in, and more, more comfortable and willing and able to rally people around whatever it is they're doing, independent of any special training. Like we have, we've not done a really good job of training people around soft skills or, or being more human or whatever. Um, and, and there's a whole mix of types of folks in our organization, like fr from really extremely brusque and, and not particularly fun to be around all the way to you know, very polished and, and really easy to, to be connected with. Uh, so, so, I mean, I think our long point is that the systemic change point that you're making, I, I think there's something to creating environments that over time help people to think about leadership differently, help people or cause people to demand different things from their leaders and to expect different things from leaders. Can I ask all of the panel very briefly to just maybe pluck from their experience or from their imagination if you need to, an example of where leadership has mattered recently for you in, in, your, in your professional work, where a threat's come along, where you need leadership skills. Just give us, because I think if we share these, we might, we might shock a few people in the audience. If you can think of a shocking one, please do. Blair, I don't know whether, whether you can think of anything. Um, so I can think of a situation where maybe the aha moment came a bit late, but it did, it did come. Um, an organization we were working with that um, was growing through acquisition um, and um, the board felt very confident that they knew how to just bring these companies on board um, and they, they didn't. Uh, they, they didn't know how to do it. And by the time they realized they didn't know how to do it, um, they were already in trouble. And we worked with them for about 18 months <clears throat> and I remember very clearly about 16 months into the work, and we knew the work was coming to the end after 18 months, um, my colleague uh, Ginny, who's here in the audience, and I, uh, we had a little, a little chat and we said, we, we're going to have to, if we're going to feel good about this work, we're going to have to risk getting fired, um, and we're going to have to risk telling them what we really think. Um, so we did. Um, they sent us out of the room while they had a chat about it, during which time we thought, let's order taxis so we can just get out of here. Uh, but it turned out that they, that they agreed with, with what we had said. And the very brave and bold thing that they then did um, was uh, they acted on the feedback. Um, and they pulled together some of their people from around their organization, and they did a, a day of just listening. Um, and they, they were in a very receptive frame of mind, the, these guys, the, mm. these board members. Um, and the stuff they were told was really, really hard for them to hear. 
I remember the CEO uh, took, me to a site, took me aside in the afternoon after hearing a lot of this stuff. And, I mean, you could have knocked me down because he, he was also someone who had grown up from the bottom of the organization, kind of quite a macho guy, um, seeming to have basically no emotional intelligence at all. And he said, shame on me. Shame on me for not seeing this. Mm. And I think, I mean, I fell a little bit in love with him in that moment. <laughs> um, and uh, I, I think that it, it was evidence to me that it is possible for people, and we've heard a lot about listening today and really, really listening, listening to the stuff that is going to disrupt your mm. view of the world. Mm. That's the stuff that needs to be listened to. Um, and he, he heard it, and it made a big difference. Jonathan, what about you? Any, any examples you can give us? Just kind of racking my brains. The, one of the first things I did um, after becoming leader is that I, I want to go to the, the refugee camp in Calais. I, I just, I get very emotional when I talk about this. I, I just think it's an absolute scandal that in the fifth richest economy in the world, less than 50 miles from our shore, there is a refugee crisis. Yeah. It, 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 <laughs> and, I felt it was really important that a leader of a political party went over there and actually mm. went and talked to the refugees, and I did it. Um, one and a half thousand children. We, had, we could have done something about that. Mm. We could have brought one and a half thousand vulnerable children that have come from Afghanistan and Sudan, fleeing conflict, who were facing tear gassing by the French authorities, who were being raped who were being dragged out of the camp by far-right group, far right groups and humiliated and stripped naked. I mean, it is, it is, it's horrent that our government didn't put anyone on the ground there, didn't show any leadership in sorting out that crisis, and the refugees became pawns in a political game between two political leaders in France and Britain. Um, and I think the, the other time that I'm, I'm really, I think Alicia did was significant was after the Conservative Party conference when we saw the mask, and get political here, we saw the mask slip. Uh, again, and to reveal the nasty party around refugees and migration, with some really nasty rhetoric coming out from the Conservative leadership, Andrew Rudd and, and the Prime Minister. Uh, and the response that Labour produced was, was a, a meme on Twitter criticising the Conservatives for not cutting migration enough. Mm. And my heart just sank. Uh, and so we got together with Leanne Wood, uh, and Nicola Sturgeon uh, from Plaid and, and the Scottish National Party, and we wrote a joint letter, an open letter saying, we've got to draw a line in the sand here. This has gone too far. We have to show political leadership. And to their credit, the next day, Labour changed their tone after that letter came out. Sadly, they didn't take part in the letter, but I think the leadership of the smaller parties there saying, we're going to draw a line in the sand here because someone has to do it, did influence Labour, did turn them around, and I think we're going to have to go on fighting together as progressives. Uh, you know, we've let this debate go far too far one way, and we have to fight back. We have to make the positive case for being an open-hearted nation, uh, taking our fair share of refugees, and saying, actually, we're proud to have freedom of movement, and this is something we have to fight for very, very strongly. Faisal, so, what about you? I mean, either from the class or from the wider world, what, what, Give us an example. Yeah, so it's one of those, right, when you're going to leave the room, I'm going to think of, like, the perfect thing. Um, <laughs> yeah, so I, let me ju just draw on something. Um, when I was at Sabre Children, I did a lot of the international work. Um, there was big decisions made last year on whether, on what the new sustainable development goals would be, what would happen, happen to financing for development and what, would, what that would look like um, in terms of sort of the rich block of countries versus the other block of countries. Um, and I've probably never been more embarrassed to be British, to be honest, See, sitting there and seeing that conversation play out where, where um, the low, in, low and middle income countries had come together um, and they were demanding certain things that the West should do, which were very unfair. So one of the biggest things they were asking for, for, for instance, was um, something called tax. Like, can we just have an international body on tax where we all come together equally and we work out what the rules should be? Um, and within the kind of Europe bloc, um, the Americans were very against it, the British were very against it. Um, and, and, and what was really clear in that moment was um, within, within the EU bloc, there were some countries that were coming round to it, um, but Britain were really showing leadership in a way that was very negative, like block, blocking that body from happening. Um, and 
and so I saw the way in which leadership can result in some really poor and bad outcomes. But also in the, in the biggest scale, when I went to the final conference where they were going to make the final decision and sign the declaration and what have you, um, there was such a lack of political leadership around this money for actually changing the world. You know, there's no point in just having a list of things you want to change without the money. You know, there wasn't really any big um, political uh, leader that turned up from the West. Um, no one showed any leadership in that moment. And, and the conference, whilst they had to do this talk around it about, oh, it's great, and we, that we may agreed this and that, it was rubbish. Like, there was basically nothing that changed because of the lack of anyone that would stand up and say the money matters and this is what we're willing to forego. Um, and, and it was just so disappointing. In the, in the, at the global level, um, and, and the, you know, all of them turned up to sign the Sustainable Development Goals, which literally mean nothing without the money to back it up, and, and, and it, was, it was really disappointing. And, and despite what we say about leadership here in terms of, um, you know, lead, everyone should be a leader and it shouldn't just be... We've never needed more leadership in a way, and we saw that with the Occupy movement, when there aren't those people that, are, that come forward and really make the case and fight it and are the spokespeople, um, we can fail. Wow, you had to pay, put me last? <laughs> uh, so I, I, am, uh, I don't really see myself as, as much of a leader, but if you allow me to tell a really relatively inconsequential story, um, because those are, all, all of those stories are huge and hugely impactful, but something that I think for me really illustrates the slightly different sort of boots on the ground, small scale sort of leadership that that I'm passionate about. I, I've, I've always thought that the, the most interesting part of leadership is, the most interesting and, and relevant purpose of leadership is figuring out ways to elevate the people around you mm. and help the people around you flourish. Mm. And, uh, and maybe to me, actually, that's the only interesting thing about leadership. Maybe not, I don't know. But the, um, I think if you'll allow me to pat myself on the back a little bit, yes, only because I have scarce examples and... <laughs> Uh, but as I mentioned earlier, I, I've got a family with a number of children, and my 14-year-old my son, our second, decided recently he was in love with the sport of basketball. You all know basketball. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know. At this point, I have no idea what, what, <laughs> what crosses over culturally. Um, he was in love with the sport of basketball, but he never really played basketball. So he and I went and played basketball a few times at the park, and he said he'd like to join a team. And the next day he came back and said, you know, Dad, I've decided I'm not going to join a team. And I said, well, why not? And he said, because I, I went and played with some of, the friend, some of the friends who have been on the team for a few years, and they're so much better than me. So I'm going to find a different sport. And I thought about that for a couple of days. I went back to him. I said, you know, you know, I want you to ask the best person, you know, the best person that you've played with out, out there on the, on the court, how, how many years they've been playing and, and how many hours a week they play. And he did, and he came back, and it was like four or five years and some number of hours per week. And I asked him to do the math and figure out how many cumulative hours they've spent playing basketball. And then I asked him to do the same for himself. And, of course, the ratio was enormous, you know, some thousand, couple of thousand hours compared to, you know, 40 or 50 hours total. And I said, so is it any surprise that that person is better than you? And he said, well, I guess when you think about it that way, it's not. And I said, so then if you want to be the best at something and there are people around you who have invested a lot more time and energy, it simply comes down to, it's a mathematical formula. And, and it's a mistake to think about yourself as a person who is not good at basketball relative to the other people who are good at basketball. And in reality, it's a function of the energy and focus and time that they put into it. And, 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 and so I guess my point is that I thought for a long time that my job as a parent was to help my kids find their place, and my, and my job as a manager to the degree that I'm a leader or manager in an organization is help people find their place. But if, if I shift that a little bit and think about the ways that I can help people to flourish and recognize the stuff that they have in them that they didn't realize was in them that can help them to become whatever it is that they want to become, uh, I think that was probably the most salient example. And it's interesting. He spends every single day, maybe two and a half, three hours down at the court practicing basketball. And that seems kind of inconsequential, but I do think that there's a really important principle there that's much more broadly transferable to our day-to-day -day work lives, possibly not things like, um, you know, uh, mm. you know crisis, national crises or things like that. But, but the, the, world, the world I come from, I think that that's maybe one of the most important and 
powerful things that we have at our disposal as mm. prospective leaders. That's, that is an amazing example. Thank you. Um, I, I want to throw one in while, before I come back to everybody else. Uh, on, I, I, I do a lot of thinking about strategy, and I wanted to. The, the question I'm going to throw at you all before I. Uh, so you can think about it is where should strategy belong in a leadership team uh, in the current situation with so many things changing? But I. Um, do a lot of you know, a lot of social historical reading and research, and I noticed a very a very interesting and similar thing about the two ways that Russian military leaders have dealt with the invasion of their country. Okay, so one you can read in War and Peace. In in, in War and Peace, uh, Tolstoy describes the way that Russian generals fought Napoleon on the battlefield. Those of you who know it will know what the answer is. They just sat there and thought, "Hmm, that's interesting." Uh, we'll wait and see what happens now as this unfolds. And you can see the, the hero, uh, Pierre Bazukov, who is a all energy, all agency, all focus, wants them to go, do this, do this, do this. And, and through Tolstoy's eyes, we see it's General Bagration and then Kutuso, Marshal Kutuso. We see the wisdom that of, if you, you, you can do a lot of damage by rushing your troops hither and thither and reacting to everything that they had. In fact, their, their, their key thing was they kind of knew that they had a bunch of you know, ill-educated peasants in uniform and a lot of aristocrats on horseback, and that roughly, if you put so many of them into a square mile, they'll hold back the enemy for a number of hours. And there's no need to think about you know, tactics. But your grand strategy is keep retreating. Just keep retreating until they give up. And what is amazing is that, you know, there's two fantastic books by John Erickson, the military historian, about the Soviet Union's uh, defeat of the Wehrmacht in World War II. And it bo basically boils down to the same thing. A series of errors, disasters, and myopic decisions leads to victory simply because the strategic situation is on your side. Now, I mention that because it's a nice way of segueing into... We, are certainly in politics, a lot in... Uh, foreign affairs and diplomacy in Britain, but also a lot in business, we have this strategy deficit. You find it everywhere. Who's the strategist? You know, thank God McKinsey exists, otherwise, you know, what would we do about, without, about strategy? But what, what, let me come back to you, Blair, and, and start with you. Where should strategy, that deep level, big level, long-range decision-making be, belong? And who's good at it at the moment? What kind of people? So strategy is one of those words that um, gets used to mean lots of different things. Um, and I think that there's something more important than strategy, which we've mentioned a few times, mentioned a few times today, which is around purpose. I think um, leaders, and I, I sort of inverted commas, are people at the top of organizations mm -hmm. as opposed to mm -hmm. leaders, um, spend a lot of time trying to create a strategy by which they mean a plan. Mm. A one-year plan, a two-year plan, a five-year plan. Um, and then uh, and a huge amount of resource goes into that and a huge amount of reporting and reporting up and the finances of it. And, the whole, and then they have this beautiful plan. It's on a Gantt chart or something. Mm. And every month, they hold people accountable to, the, to, to this chart that bears no resemblance to reality ever, and you continue to fail, and someone gets blamed for that failure, when the strategy could never have been planned uh, that far in advance. So to me, I, I, I don't like to spend a lot of time strategizing. I think you've got the purpose, and you're really, really clear as an organization what you're here to do, who you're serving, what, you, what your role is in the world. And then, and I got this, actually, it's Tom Nixon here. I interviewed him for my book, and he made this point about, about what happens then, which is, you just do the next thing. <laughs> so what is the next thing we need to do to deliver on that purpose? And then you wait. Mm. And there's not anywhere near enough waiting. And you know, we talk about crises. Of course there's crises all the time, <laughs> because firstly, it's manufactured to create a hero um, who then fixes it. But also, there's crisis because we don't spend anywhere near enough time thinking mm. before we act. And that means we're always trying to pick up the pieces of bad decisions we've made. So I would much rather see uh, leaders, or senior people, whoever we, however we want to label it, thinking very, very closely about their purpose and then just 
making the next decision mm. that feels right and is in alignment with the values of the organization, the principles that, they, that they've decided to adhere to, and then wait until the next decision becomes clear. That's really, that's really interesting. Okay, Jonathan, who owns strategy in the Green Party and who should own strategy? It, it falls uh, on the, the co-leaders mm. to, to do the political strategy. Um, Who's good at strategy at the moment? The Tories. The Conservatives are very good at strategy. They won the last election by ruthlessly targeting uh, Lib Dem seats in the South West. They knew that's what they needed to do to get their majority, and they did it. Uh, and it really pains me to say it. I, who's not good at political strategy at the moment? The left is not good at political strategy at the moment. Self-evident. Um, one of my heroes is Tony Benn. And when he, when he retired, he said, I'm leaving the House of Commons to concentrate on politics. <laughs> uh, after 50 years at the coalface, he recognised that it's often social movements that are outside the control of strategy that actually do shift the agendas and, and, yeah. and goalposts. I think there's a lot to be said for that. I think we need to be thinking politically much <coughs> beyond Westminster and looking at social movements. Um, but at the same time, I think we have to have a coherent political strategy. Now, one thing we've been, and we've been involved in this, Paul, um, We've been talking with the idea of forming a progressive alliance. We're saying, look, let's be realistic. First, let's be realistic in, in what this means for the next few decades in this country politically. Um, with boundary changes that are going through, it looks conceivably uh, like we are staring as a country down the barrel of several decades of conservative rule. That's, that's the stark political reality. We may see big social movements changing things, but that's it. What is going to change... Uh, that electoral reform is the big thing that's going to change that because we have a government at the moment elected on the, the votes of just 24% of the adult population. It is not a democratic situation, and we could see 24%, 23%, 22% of the country forming conservative governments for years to come. The way to break this is electoral reform. Okay, so how do we get there? We could target, we could work together with Labour and the Lib Dems, we could stand aside for one another in seats around the country where there are maybe 50 or 60 conservative MPs. Where the Lib Dem has a chance of winning, we back the Lib Dem. Where the Labour candidate has a chance of winning, we back the Labour candidate. Or we have open primaries and we engage whole communities in selecting a candidate to stand against the Conservative. Okay, has this happened in history? Yes, it has. In 1997, uh, Martin Bell stood in Tatton against Neil Hamilton as an independent. The other parties stood aside and he beat uh, Neil Hamilton in a safe Tory seat. Now, that's that strategy. Sorry, I have to wrap it up. I love this stuff. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so where's that coming from? It's only going to work from the bottom up, and that strategy has to be owned by the social movement. Yeah. That's how it's going to happen. But where does it come from? The germs are coming from the leadership. Pfizer, I mean, obviously, you know, the trade unions, uh, their strategy is, you know, um, clearly has got to up its game because they're, they've stabilised their membership, but they're not, grow you know, not massively growing. And you hosted Corbyn, didn't you, at, the, at, your, uh, at your conference uh, two weeks ago? I was there too. You hosted me. Thank you. Um, do you think he's got a strategy? Or who should own the strategy for, for the left? For, because for all the criticisms you might have of Labour, it still has you know, uh, more than half a million members. It hopefully does have a strategy. What do you think it should be? And who should own that? Yeah, I mean, I think um, I really agree with the point about having your line of sight. What, what are you aiming for? And like, that's the ultimate thing. Um, and then sort of build back from that. Um, the thing is about strategy, so we have, so for instance, I got into this job at class and I was like, we need a strategy. Um, and then like Brexit happened and then that strategy doesn't mean anything anymore. You know, the world keeps changing so you can have this strategy, but it, it doesn't mean anything. Mm. What is important is less the kind of, um, we're gonna do this paper on this subject, so we're gonna, uh, is, is that line of sight what we're aiming for? And I think for the left now, um, that does come back to the values we need to get back on the table that are going, um, that are you know, worryingly less and less of the population are seen as something that they can see as their own values as well. Um, so I think the strategy has to be about how you tell those stories um, and how you connect back with people and connect back with the broader population. And that, and that, you know, it hurts me to say it because I'd love to say that that's, you know, that's got to be owned by the whole movement. Of course, um, all of us have to be doing our job, but the Labour Party needs to have a very clear strategy about the story and narrative that they're telling, and it hasn't, it hasn't been clear to date, and that has to be, to some degree, owned by the, se the senior leaders. Um, and if I'm honest, I think that's where you know, things are going wrong, and that's where the void is, 
the, when you don't have a strategy on at least that part of you know, what next year we need to make sure we go out and we push these values and we tell that story in this way, then it just leaves a void. And it, or you just have one person saying it over here, someone contradicting you over here. I mean, that's what happens on the immigration staff within the Labour Party. You have one part that says that is positive about it and another part that is. So for me, that has to be owned by those at the top of the Labour Party as they are now. And they have to find ways in which to reach across to the other, the other members of the party and, and, and embed that. Okay, and let me give the final word to you, Paul. Uh, bring it back to business for us, if you can. Uh, who owns strategy in your company? Uh, it, does, does that work? Mm. Do, 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 the, do the associates, the, the colleagues, feel that they know what the strategy is? Yeah, so I mean, I, th I think there, there are echoes of everything that you all said here. And, and to briefly summarize my answer to your question, I think the idea of a, a core purpose that is generally unchanging but represents kind of the lofty vision for the organization, combined with you know adaptability and willingness to kind of alter course as circumstances come up, and the realization that some of the best elements to strategy are going to come from the ground up, and the realization that there are people all over the organization that aren't necessarily paid to think up the big ideas, but they're going to, in some way or another, uncover the direction that we should be going and creating opportunities and ways for that to become the strategy as opposed to crafting the strategy and asking people to pursue it. Right. Uh, the reason I put my glasses on was to try and read my non-existent schedule here. And, but, you know, <laughs> I, I think the schedule says that the, the, the session ends here. And uh, thank you to, <laughs> to, my, to my guests for what I hope has been an interesting and wide... I mean, we could talk forever. I tried to keep it away from the hard politics because we could talk forever about it and it will just be... Uh, an angst session. I, I hope we feel we've learned something, and I certainly have from, from, from this. Um, we'll do, we'll, because we run over time, we won't do a reflection at this point, but we'll, we'll sort of, we'll, we'll, you can reflect, you've probably been reflecting in the, in the, in, in the hour-long session that we've had. And therefore, we'll thank our panel, uh, clear off, and come back uh, for the final bit. Thank you.